Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Negotiation. My name is Todd Embley. I am your host, as usual, and I am pleased to be joined by Dave McCoggin today. Dave is the founder and storyteller at Bibliosexual. He's an APAC marketing legend. He's been based in the market since 1995. He's worked with brands like Coca-Cola, MasterCard, Nestle, Cafe Pacific, and many others. So we're really looking to the, forward to this conversation today with Dave. Dave, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, thanks, Todd. And thanks for asking me to join you. Yeah, we're, we're pleased to have you. I'm glad I got your name right. McCoggin is not. It's an old Irish name. It's not easy to figure out when you see it not in print. Easy. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And I did, for those, I, I'm usually pretty good at it. For uh, for those that have, have, have seen me try to stumble with names before, I think I'm usually pretty good. But this one I did not get. I did not nail. I had to be taught how to say the name. Uh, and thank you That's for cool. being my teacher. Don't worry yeah. about it. <laughs> so where in the world are you today where you're recording this from? Sure. Well, I, I'm in Bangkok. I This is my home uh, for the last seven years, second time around living in Bangkok. Um, uh, moved back here in 2015, and I based myself from here. Uh, of course, like a lot of people, over COVID times, I got stuck. I actually got stuck in Sydney where my son and daughter both live, went down to visit them and got caught for a year, but basically Bangkok's home. Yeah. Okay, great. Listen, why don't we, and we're going to talk about a lot of the things that you are doing and that you have done, but sure. I gave a little snippet into who you are. Can you give us a little expanded version into your background? Yeah, sure. Uh, obviously, I'm an Aussie. Uh, you can tell by the accent. Uh, born and raised in Sydney. Um, Worked in advertising in Sydney uh, for uh, McCann, the big global ad agency, uh, for about nine years, and then got transferred for two years to Asia, which then stretched to 19. Um, and so I was working for them based first here in Bangkok and then later on in Hong Kong, briefly in China, 10 years in Japan, then back in Hong Kong, and then eventually parted ways after, you know, more than 25 years with them. Um, and that... My main job at McCann was I was the head of strategy planning for Asia Pacific, which, you know, uh, meant that I wasn't actually, you know, I'm terrible. I, I can't write a script for an ad. Uh, I don't, I'm a terrible photographer. I don't do any of that stuff. My job was to figure out what the client's issue was and really what the advertising or the marketing communication needed to address and how to address it and then write the brief for the guys that designed the advertising or the PR or whatever. So then when I left McCann, um, fortunately, you know, people kept on, you know, heard that I'd left and sort of said, hey, well, you know, can you come and do a project for me? Can you come and do this project for, for us? And I've ended up um, doing three sorts of work, I guess. I do a lot of work with companies that are trying to understand the marketplace in Asia. Now, historically, as you mentioned, I've worked historically with a lot of the big Western companies, L'Oreal, Cafe, uh, you know, MasterCard, Coke, Nestle. But increasingly, that's also been working with Asian companies that are trying to do something different in other parts of Asia. So a Japanese company hmm. trying to expand its business in Asia or an Indian company that's expanding its business globally, that sort of thing. Um, so that's been quite interesting as, as that's happened. Um, and so part of what I do is figure out what the story is that a, the brand or the company wants to tell, who it wants to tell it to, and what's the best way to frame that story. And then that gets me involved sometimes in doing sort of research into what is the narrative that's going to stick or what are, yeah. what are, the, what are the key narratives going on that, that you know, a, a company or a brand might want to try to take advantage of. Um, and that, again, becomes quite interesting in tracking what are the narratives across all sorts of things. Well, you know, obviously from within categories, but also much, much more importantly, outside of categories. My, my one belief is that uh, a marketer's main role is to understand what matters to people. It's not about understanding how they use your product. It's what matters to those people. And then you've got to figure out what your product and service can do to help them with whatever matters to them, right? So a lot of it is figuring that out and, and look, as looking in different marketplaces across Asia and trying to understand, well, what are the similarities, differences uh, in different groups of people that different companies may be trying to reach or target or 
talk to in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it kind of goes along the, the vein of don't be a solution looking for a problem. Go find the problem, understand the problem, and then figure out how you can align a solution for that problem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. I think I, I, it's sort of interesting because, as you know, marketing and everything in marketing and, that, and marketing communication sort of goes in waves. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways, nothing's changed for a thousand years. Um, yeah. Literally nothing has changed for a thousand years. Um, all we're doing is tactically doing the same thing slightly differently because of new technologies or new mediums. But, but the reality of it is that if you think about great brands, successful companies, the ones that last over time, it's got nothing actually to do with the actual product. Um, you know, uh, you can talk about where, when you actually dig into it, you usually find out, well, actually their products are me too product, right? Like the, the classic Coke and Pepsi thing, right? 99% of people can't tell, tell the difference in a blind taste test, right? Um, right. Uh, the classic thing about uh, Apple, right? You know, is their technology really superior? No, not really. Most of it in the early days was actually borrowed technology. They just, what they did was they delivered it in a way that people wanted because they found out what mattered to people, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Nike, you know, is a great brand, a great, you know, leading global leading brand, initially made for serious, serious, serious runners, right? But the, the breakthrough when they came out was realizing that everybody wants to be a sort of hero and a sports star in their mind. We, you know, I'm, I'm a 60-something male who in his heart is still waiting for for the Australian soccer team to ring up and say, you're, you're going to play in the World Cup, right? You're in. Um, you know, you're in, right? Um, and that's what great brands do. They figure out what really matters to people and play to that, right? So, Yeah. It's what you just said. So first of all, like the, 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 the cola, you know, the, the Pepsi challenge, right? You know, that kind of, uh, which is a very interesting business case in of its own right, where, you know, because of the Pepsi challenge and the success that they had with that campaign, right? All, having Coke abandon what had made them successful for so long to go to the new Coke formula based on the Pepsi challenge results, which in essence, weren't something that you could actually base that level of decision on, given that people don't sip they don't take one ounce shots of yeah. cola. They drink a 355 milliliter can. And right. eventually somewhere during the consumption of that can, the sweetness of Pepsi and then the, 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 the more yeah. diluted sweetness of Coca-Cola changes your perception of how it is. And, and, and that's something that we've always trained and taught with our entrepreneurs is don't fall for the sip test, right? Because yeah. if, they don't, if they aren't actually consuming your product the way that they will normally, then the data that you're gathering from the SIP test can't truly be relied upon uh, to make huge decisions. And so you yeah, kind of exactly. taught me about that. Yeah. What years were you with Coca-Cola and were you around for kind of that Pepsi fiasco in the Philippines? Yeah, I, I worked on uh, the Coke brand from 1986 through till 2013. Um, oh. uh, it cross across different countries within the greater Asia Pacific region. Um, so I was fortunate to work on a number of interesting things. Uh, um, I was actually working as the strategist on the first time that Coca Cola, it's the first Western brand to ever do a Ramadan specific TV commercial, wow. uh, which was something we generated out of Southeast Asia and was used in something like 40 um, Muslim countries around the world. Um, and a few years later, I was, the, I was in charge of the project to develop the first Chinese New Year commercial by a Western brand in China uh, for Coca-Cola. So these are really, you know, it, taking the heritage of Coca-Cola and the Santa Claus thing, you know, but then totally localizing it to what's the main celebration of the year in Mm -hmm. the biggest parts of the world, right? The biggest populations of the world. Um, and so yeah. doing that sort of project was really interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, at the same time, there were also times when, you know, we were, in, you know, involved in stuff that was going on with different issues uh, around the around the brand or, you know. Yeah. As you do. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that 
up without your knowledge, just so everybody knows, Dave did not know that was coming, because I just watched a Netflix documentary on the Pepsi Where's My Jet. And it was what they, when they ran the ads for the Harrier Jet. And in that documentary, uh, documentary they covered um, something that had happened in, in the Philippines, which kind of drew the Asia part of the conversation and you being with Coke. Um, and so for anybody who really wants to dive into that, I suggest you, you run over and, and check out that Netflix uh, documentary. But I think for the purposes of this podcast, we'll, we'll keep going here. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, we have to talk about bibliosexual. I'm sure when I mentioned it at the, at the top, I ran right over it. Uh, yeah. People may have like gone, whoa, 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 whoa. What did he just say? Yeah, right. So right. let's go back and solve that um, for people who are probably wondering uh, if we're going to get there. Tell us about the name. Okay. <laughs> Here it is, right? So I, I, for I, those of you listening audio only, he just showed us a business card that says bibliosexual yeah. on it. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, and the reason is exactly that, the business card, right? So I, I live and work in Asia. So in 2015, I've got to, a step, I've got to set up a company uh, and register a company somewhere so I can start charging some clients, right? Um, I'm living in Hong Kong and decided and, you know, just da-da-da and goofing around. And actually the term bibliosexual is something that I've been playing around with for 20 years using in different presentations, so my wife and I are just talking about it. She goes, well, why don't you just call it, call, call it bibliosexual because at least it'll get interest, right? And, of course, the beauty of it is that when you walk up, and as you know, in Asia, even today as we come out of COVID, it's, it's gone back to you use a lot of business cards, right? Not so much in North America anymore, but in Asia you're mm. still handing over business cards all the time. And the beauty is when you hand over a business card and all it's got is this big bibliosexual on it, people go, well, as you do, they just go, what, what the hell does that? You know, what does yeah. that mean? And that allows me to tell a story, right? And, and of course, you know, when you're in business in general, when you're in the marketing business, you know, storytelling is fundamental. And so you want to have a chance to tell a story. And the story is quite simple. Many, many years ago, before I got into advertising, I was a children's librarian. I spent 10 years working in children's libraries in Sydney. And when you work in the public children's libraries, you end up with a lot of time to kill. So I just used to read a lot of books. Um, to kill time. And one day I'm reading a novel and there's a character who was described as a bibliosexual. What the hell is that, right? So I look it up and it turns out bibli being a bibliosexual is an actual fetish. It's a recognized sexual fetish where it's somebody who's sexually stimulated by the smell and touch of books. Now, okay. it then turns out that this is actually based on science because you know, when you go into an old library or an old, old bookstore and there's that sort of slightly vanilla -y smell that comes up, right? That's the yeah. glue in the bindings. And okay. there's something in that glue that there's a chemical in that glue that actually stimulates your brain slightly sexually. Now, for some people, it triggers a more, a more sexual thing. I found that really interesting. But what it, what it really got me thinking about was the fact that there are different mediums. Everybody has particular mediums that for reasons we just can't figure out, we are totally biased towards or we fall in love with or we think that's much, much better, right? And if you're a marketer, it's really important to understand which mediums really matter irrationally in many ways to people. Yeah. And so, for example, the quickest way for me to explain it is uh, I can't think in Western Canada, I can't think of the name of a newspaper. But if you think about the most rubbish newspaper in in uh, in Canada, right, whatever it might be, right, mm -hmm. um, and I write an article about anything, and I and that's printed in that newspaper. If you read it in that newspaper, you'd probably go, "This guy Dave McCockin's a total dick," right? Because it. But if the exact same article was in the Economist, you'd go, "Well, that sounds pretty intelligent," right? Mm -hmm. Now, why is that? Well, that's because for a certain part of the world. Probably, I'm assuming for people like you, the economist, it means quality journalism. Trashing newspapers mean trash. Now, for other people, it'll be the other way around. Oh, the economist is just full of wankers. Whereas, you know, oh, I can understand what this newspaper is it's saying the stuff I want to hear, right? Yeah. So that's why I, I called it bibliosexual. And that's why it's an effective way when I'm talking to clients, prospective clients, you know, business people, etc. 
when I'm giving talks at, at, at conferences, it's a way for me to get back to, have you really thought through what's really important to the people you want to reach? And sometimes it's mediums that you hadn't thought about, right? And so that's okay. part of the game. Let me ask you a question that I think might be top of mind with some of our listeners as I try to put myself in their shoes. Just the word sexual, the topic yeah of sex, the entire culture and attitude around that in that area of the world, does it cause you, and, and I mean, uh, my assumptions are wrought in this question of, of for sure. Does that ever cause you some, some, some grief, some pain, some, some, yeah, some sure. static, some friction sure, sure. of getting over that? Sure. When I first registered the company name in, uh, in Hong Kong, the question came back, is this a pornography site? Right. Um, sure. And naturally, you do get sometimes that reaction, right? Now, most of the time, the reaction across Asia, across all sorts of cultures, is just sort of a bit like you. It's a, it's sort of slightly bewilderment, bewilderment like, well, what the hell does this, right? Um, but it allows me to tell the story, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yes, you know, sometimes, and, and of course, you have to be very touchy. Now, you know, depending on who you're talking to, but think about that, I mean, if I'm in Canada or, or the United States or England or France or Germany, I also have to be careful, right, about who I talk to about what. We, we all do in, in whatever we're, we're talking about. You know, if you think about, particularly if you think about things like um, the last couple of years and the way the COVID has generated anxiety around certain subjects, right? So you know that the subject of a mask, before we started recording, you and I were joking about something about ma wearing a mask, right? Yeah. You know that there are certain people, it's a touch point, right? It's like, yeah. this, 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 oh, you know. Touch the subject. Yeah, you know, you're completely reducing my human rights and all this sort of stuff. Triggered. Whereas, as, as you would know from, because you lived in China, you would know that in a lot of East Asia, well before COVID, wearing a mask was just a normal thing. But it was worn you wore it because you were feeling sick and you were trying to protect society, not you were trying to be protected. For, so it's a very different angle yeah. from the Asian yeah. perspective of wearing a mask to the Western perspective of wearing a mask, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, all sorts of subjects. So you yeah, have to The be, mask said something about me, but then right. it became what I'm saying about you. Yes, yes. And then the same thing with vax, you know, vax and anti-vax and all that sort of stuff. Um, the whole work from home thing, of course, where we've seen these different waves and now we're going through another wave again about the reaction to work from home. And, you know, is is it when Co Elon Musk makes a comment about everybody's going to come back to work. Oh, my God, what an evil guy. Yeah. You know, um, it's not the first time we've been through that either. I mean, there no, was a whole future of work, holacracy movement and Zappos and, and Yahoo. And I mean, this is not the first wave we've gone through. No, of course not. Either. Of course not. And, and but but the, the whole thing is. That to your point about you made briefly about the Coke Pepsi challenge, right? Is yes. that you have to be aware of the real sense of the way of what people are. So it doesn't matter yeah. whether if I'm designing a campaign to reach a million people in in Malaysia about X, I have to think about am I targeting the the Chinese Malays or the Malay Malays, right? Because yeah. there'll be slight differences in the way they will react to things, right? Uh, in the same way that quite obviously, if I'm, if I'm doing a campaign in Korea and Thailand, I may have to think about, you know, Korea and Thailand, yes, they're both in Asia, but they're very different in a lot of ways. Okay. But they also have, they also have now have some more similarities because a lot of Thais just love Korean soap operas. So, you know. <laughs> you know, okay. So save the future, um, homogenization of the region potential, if I could just put it that way. Yeah. Like, cause, cause now, you know, K-pop and they, you know, we're starting yeah. to get tastes of other cultures in, you know, where it's now allowing for, for more interest and, and, and that will bring the rest with it. And hopefully we start to understand, but um, it's interesting that you say that. And it does kind of segue a little bit into where I want to go with this conversation, which is breaking it down by region. Because you, sure. you, you've worked in all, all, so many different regions, and I think that's a very interesting way to go about this. And I want to start with um, Japan, right? And, and so for anybody who hasn't visited Japan, you've worked in Japan a lot. How would you describe the Japanese consumer on the whole? 
are probably the most precise in the world. So different bits of research will tell you things like a typical, and uh, please uh, any, don't uh, anybody be upset when I use the term housewife generically. I'm not trying to be sexist or anything like that. But, you know, a, a lot of research that would say the typical housewife, as in house, household shopper in Japan, is three times more likely to read the back of the pack on anything than anywhere else in the world. Three times more likely than anywhere else in the world. So that means that, for example, and you know, when I lived in Japan, we did projects where, and we did very successful campaigns where the only thing we changed was a single line on the back of the pack. Was it and ingredients? It was, sometimes, or just a benefit, uh, or, okay. or, or just, a, or just, hey, did you realize that if you use this, it will do this. Okay. Small print on the back of the pack, right? Okay. That was all we needed. Um, so they are extremely fussy about things, right? Quality is everything um, mm -hmm. and much more so. And of course you see that in other marketplaces, but much more on a constant basis in that marketplace. It's why you have to be very, very careful about um, uh, the backstory, uh, about the product, about the how the quality is there. Um, but it also explains some things like, you know, uh, you probably know that in advertising terms, uh, Japanese ads are more likely to use celebrities in ads than anywhere else in the world. It's the number one market in the world. And so uh, typically, for example, uh, it's you're twice as likely to use a celebrity ad in Japan as you are in the, in the United States. And some people, particularly some people working in the advertising market industry that come from the West, think, oh, that's just creative laziness. No, it's not. It's exactly the opposite of creative laziness. No, I was going to say, laziness. yeah. <laughs> but the reason why you use a celebrity is because you have, and you have to carefully choose a celebrity who to the Japanese people, not to a Canadian or an Australian or, 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 or a Frenchman, but to the Japanese people, this celebrity represents what that product delivers. Okay, and and it becomes uh, uh, it's not just saying it's not the simple thing of you know Harrison Ford drinking a scotch. Oh yeah, you know, like you just you've just paid a million bucks for him to drink the scotch. In America, that's sort of discarded as well. Nobody believes it. Japanese don't believe he drinks it either. What they believe is that that scotch embodies the characteristics that they believe Harrison Ford has. So, are you then saying that the consumers in Japan? are more easily susceptible to the transference of identity? No, they're fussier about the transference of identity. They are much fussier. Uh, I think that's the common misconception is th th this is the thing in the West. I think it's because primarily in the West, we're lazy thinkers. Um, and I'll cop to that. Right? And so what happens is, is too often we're looking for the pun. We're looking for the joke. We're looking for... Uh, the, the, part of my job. the tears. <laughs> We're looking for the easy emotion, right? Yeah. Whereas, yeah. yes, uh, and a lot of, for example, a lot of advertising in Japan is emotional. There's a lot of fun ads, right? There's a lot of jokey ads, which are jokes that, you know, are quite often physical, but also when they're verbal jokes, translation doesn't do them any credit. You know, and they don't get recognized outside of Japan because nobody really understands the context of them. That's fine. But... But my point is that, you know, working in Japan, you have to be super fussy about understanding that people are looking for the next layer, the next layer, the next layer. And, and I'll tell you what the secret, one of the things that I discovered many years ago by accident, um, uh, reading a, 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 some academic stuff, was I was working on uh, the contact lens business and we were we were doing the advertising across Asia for one of the world's, an American biggest, I won't say the name, biggest contact lens maker, right? Um, and we were having trouble in Japan, right, where distribution-wise they were great, but they weren't making the big breakthroughs that, that American headquarters thought they should be making in terms of sales. And you've got to remember the Japanese people are the most, the people most prone to needing some sort of eye, uh, eyewear or eye assistance in the world. It's just genetically yeah. in Japanese, Koreans, North Chinese. It's, it's just something about genetics that means their eyes are more susceptible to needing glasses or contact lenses at an okay. early age. Okay. Well, one of the things in doing some background work that I found was really interesting was the way we look at, a, look at things. So, for example, I'm sitting here 
you know, in my apartment, at my desk, talking to you. And as I talk to you, I'm looking at your face on the screen, right? And I'm following your face and your expressions, just this bit of your face, right? Well, Japanese people would be looking at those two pictures behind you. They would be more important to them than your face because mm. context, in Japanese culture, context is more important. So if you can't okay. see the background, you can't understand the person. You can't understand why they're saying it or how they're saying something. So, for example, if you were sitting in a, in a, in a studio with just a blank white wall behind you, that becomes problematic, right? Like, well, yeah. well what, what context is there for, for this, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's part of the cultural differences that you sort of have to understand about in Japan, it, it's that, right? But there's other things in other countries. What about um, technology? And I, you know, I, again, I have to be very conscious of time because <laughs> I, mean, I don't know if we're going to finish Japan uh, yeah. in the next 20 minutes. Now, Japan, we think of technology, you know, right. Sanyo, Samsung, whatever, just for, for decades. They've had Toyota. They've always been technologically superior in so many different arenas. Um, and we just love Japanese technology and, and games and, and, you know, Nintendo and the whole thing. Um, is that something, do we have to present a brand as we go to Japan as being technology forward? No, 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 not necessarily. I mean, from the Westerners point of view, and I guess, again, you know, uh, a lot of stuff I do end up doing is cultural stereotyping and, and country stereotyping, right? Or unstereotyping, yeah. Right, or unstereotyping. So, yes, it's true that since 1964, there has been a perception that Japan is like the, you know, a technological wonderland in some ways, and it's highly technical, right? Now, the, the truth is that Japanese people are no more technologically adept than people anywhere else. Um, they have had the advantage of the early days of the robotization of factories and things like that. Yes, there was the Sonys, the Nintendos, and the big breakthrough companies. Um, but does the day-to-day -day Japanese person, are they m more technologically fascinated than the typical Canadian? Not, not particularly. Um, <laughs> some people would argue in some way. I mean, in, in some ways, Japan is like incredibly, by, by the way you might think about it, backward. And I'll, I'll give you the simple example. If you go into a pharmacy in Japan today, 2022, there's a good chance that there will be no computer in that pharmacy. There'll be a fax machine. And they, st and they use a fax machine to order products, to get uh, anything they need from the doctor, uh, to any form of communication is done through faxes. And of course, you know, you scratch your head and you go, wow, that's so old fashioned. Like, like quite literally, something like 70% of all the fax machines sold in the world today are sold in Japan, right? Uh, uh, why is that, right? Like this is this technological marble country. Well, part of it is because within that industry, there has become a reputation that you can't trust computers because they're hackable. Fax machines are not hackable, or at least mm -hmm. they're much more difficult to hack. And so mm -hmm. if you're concerned about the privacy of your patient's information, it's safer to fax things than it is to to use a computer system. Now, okay. technological geniuses watching, listening to this will argue to death about that, right? But that's a perception in the market that yeah. what's important is the privacy of your customer overcomes the efficiency that we might put on using modern computerized systems, right? Yeah. So you have to take that on board. Okay, I'm going to need you to cancel your next two meetings for the day, and we're just going to sit here and do this. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what do I want to ask? I, I, I get picky now with, with my talking points. Um, talk to us about the waves of change, that the waves of trends. If you could pick out maybe one, two, three over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years that has brought us to where we are today in Chinese consumers. Can you point to a couple of things that really did move the goalposts more than other things? Chinese consumers? Sorry, Japanese consumers. Japanese consumers. Um, well, I think what happened was 1989, there was the famous crash. Um, and okay. so, you know, in the 80s, if you watched 
uh, Western movies made in the 80s, uh, American Hollywood movies, there was a big theme that Japan was about to overtake the world, right? Um, it was going to buy out everything. Um, yeah. And then 1989 happened and the stock market in Japan crashed. Um, there was huge upheaval amongst the big corporations. Um, and what really happened and what really mattered was that you had um, a generation that had by that stage grown up post-World War II in constant sort of success. So, you know, you had 1964 with the uh, Tokyo Olympics was a major, major uh, event it, for Japan, if globally, but for Japan, right? And inside Japan, um, you know, they purposely opened the famous bullet trains. They were open to be prepared for the things. Uh, the robot factories uh, were all set up and running for 64, right? You had this major push, right? So this is, we're back sort of thing, right? And then you go forward 25 years. So you've had 25 years to late 1989 and a whole generation has then grown up and gone to work and been successful. And you've seen constant economic growth, constant economic growth. And the property prices have gone through in Tokyo and places like that have gone through the roof, you know, and salaries are through the roof and expense accounts are through the roof. And it was ridiculous. I mean, if you'd ever been to Tokyo in the mid late eighties, it was just unbelievable the, the amount of money that, you know, was getting spent in bars. Unbelievable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then 89 happens. And suddenly you've got that generation who are now sort of early middle aged workers who suddenly, well, their careers in a sense stopped. The, 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 they didn't necessarily lose their jobs, but they didn't see the incremental growth year after year after year. They saw it flatlined. You had their own kids who might have been in the you know, late teens, early 20s, you know, ending high school, going to college, looking for jobs, who suddenly it wasn't about the fact that we're going to be kings of the world. It's going to be, well, we're going to manage. We're going to manage. So you had this big change, and that changed the way in which Japan itself looked upon itself. And it took, it, it, it's still, in a sense, still recovering from that. It, it, it's still discussed inside that about, you know, like, oh, you know. Now, think about it. That's a long time ago in, in one sense, right? I mean, uh, you know, 30-something th years ago, and we're still sort of recovering from that. So that was that was a big issue. Um, at the same time, what you also had was the ageing of the population. So mm -hmm. Japan is famously now as the oldest country in the world or whatever, right? And But the fact is that we've known this for 30 years, that it's coming. Yeah. We knew that it was aging faster than most countries. The, the number of kids per family was shrinking, shrunk dramatically very quickly. Um, they started shrinking as a population nearly 10 years ago, right? Um, and so there are actually fewer Japanese. And the, the joke was about, oh, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, one of the Japanese uh, uh, government departments actually, actually issued a thing, and it said something like, well, in the, in the year 2,643, the last Japanese person will die, right? Because they, being Japanese, they'd sort of figured out, you know, like at the current rate of decline, this is how long it's going to take, right? Um, yeah. But, but and a long time in the future. But the fact is that that's also played a big part in things, right? The, the dual thing, you have fewer proportionally fewer younger people, and you have a lot more older people. Yeah. And so that, that puts a lot of stress on things and it's changed the dynamic that we're seeing in a lot of other countries and a lot of Western countries and a lot of other developed countries. But Japan has led the way in terms of the dynamic that a 40, 45 year old woman, her just at the point where her own kids are probably finishing high school, maybe going to college or looking for a job. And so she might be getting them less dependent on her, but her own parents and in-laws are only in their 60s and will have another 30 to 40 years to live. And probably three or four of their parents are alive in their 80s. And this 40, 45-year-old woman has got to take care of them as well for the next 10, 20 years, right? So yeah. typically, if you're a sort of middle-aged Japanese couple, um, you have something like 9, 10, 11 parents and grandparents that are going to be around for somewhere between 20 and 40 years. And you're going to be the one that is sort of having to organize their life or help them organize their lives more and more. So that changes that dynamic pretty dramatically in terms of 
the way people have to think about things, think about it. And that's why Japanese people post-89 have remained. There's these continual waves that force them to be cautious, force them to be cautious about the future, about what to do, what to buy, how to invest, those sorts of things. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to start going into Southeast Asia, Asia in general, and we'll segue into that talking about youth because you're a bit of an expert in marketing to youth, um, which can be pretty tricky. They're slippery buggers, we might say. Uh, and uh, any one day to the next, you know, their taste and preference and consumer habits can change as fast as technology will allow them to, to be able to change them. So um, just broadly speaking, um, how, how do you see the changes in, in marketing to youth across Asia, Japan and beyond Thailand, however, wherever you want to kind of point to, talk to us a little bit about how youth uh, marketing to youth is different, is difficult and how it's changed. Sure. Um, again, one of the, one of the misconceptions that I often find amongst Western companies when the, if they're not heavily involved in Asia, um, or Western business people, um, is of course, if you walk into Bangkok, where I live, Kuala Lumpur, Hong Kong, Tokyo, Seoul, uh, Seoul um, you're going to see the cinemas have all the blockbusters. You know, M Marvel movies are, are massive all across Asia, right? Everybody's got a favorite Marvel character, right? Yeah. Um, but what you've got to remember that there's a parallel world going on. So, you know, one of the misconceptions is, is yes, Hollywood movies are very successful, but there's a lot of other stuff that's really happening in terms of popular culture, popular entertainment. Um, you know, Japanese-based manga uh, and the derivations of that across are huge, right? And yes, there's the Hello Kitties and stuff, but put aside the ones that you might recognize as the cutesy little ones. But, you know, yeah. I'm talking about the fact that there is literally manga for everything, right? I mean, one of the most popular manga in Japan in the last few years is a, a continuing series about an 80-year-old woman who just rediscovers her sex life, right? Um, but what at is the same manga? time... Huh? Before manga we get to, is, I, sorry, manga, manga is the Japanese form of cartoons. And so it's it's usually... Different than anime? Book, uh, anime? Anime is is uh, animations. That's, that's on TV. So yeah. anime is basically the animated version of the cartoon books. So just yeah. like... Marvel movies grew out of the comic books that, you know, that when I was young, we were reading, da, da, da. And with the TV series and movies, it's the same thing, right? Now, manga expanded out of Japan really rapidly about 25 years ago. And we saw things like Dragon Ball Z really become a major hit across Asia. Um, and, and other uh, one uh, series since then have really take off. Now, they become a an undercurrent of things, right? So you have that going on. Um, in more recent times, you have, you mentioned it before, the K-pop revolution, right? So, you know, this was a government policy by the Korean government to popularize Korean brands by popularizing Korean pop culture, right? So they went to the biggest corporations in Korea in the 90s and they said, the six, seven big chaibols, the big, big corporations in Korea who all own uh, music studios, TV studios. They made cars and all sorts of stuff, but they also own TV studios and they would make soap operas in Korea for Koreans. And they said, look, we want you to go to Vietnam, to go to the Philippines, to go to Indonesia, to go to Thailand, to go to China and go to the TV stations and give them programming. In fact, if you have to pay them to run your TV shows. Why? because the more people get used to Korea as a cool place, the more they're going to feel good about buying Korean brands. Mm -hmm. So they work together that way. And so it started with soap, uh, soap operas uh, out of Korea and then K-pop. And of course, now we have things like BTS, who arguably, you know, like one of the biggest bands or mm -hmm. maybe the biggest band in the world for the last couple of years. Um, yeah. Now sort of in semi breakup for a while, but I just, <laughs> You know, one of one of the main yeah. one of the main guys has just had a number one hit across Asia. You know, in the last couple of weeks, right? So, um, ah, 
so so that's that will continue and that that's sort of happening um where you have asia-based pop culture affecting young people and then of course in more the more recent times and the most recent times the big thing is mobile gaming so yeah. across asia but particularly in southeast asia the statistics say that for people under 30 the number one medium that they engage in every day is mobile games, as in the amount of time they put into it. And it's, and it's usually somewhere between three to four hours a day, every day, playing mobile games. And so more and more marketers and business people are now starting to, you know, we think of, sometimes we think of gaming as entertainment. We don't think of it as media in the same way that we may think of television as media, right? Mm -hmm. um, but mobile gaming is a medium. And increasingly what we're seeing is uh, companies are going to have to start thinking if they want to reach young Asia, they're going to have to do their messaging inside games uh, because that's the medium that they participate in. That's the right. thing they're really interested in. Right. Okay, so let me take that and package that together with maybe a little bit of my question around technology forward for brands entering Japan, kind of thing. And let me just ask you for Southeast Asia then, um, what technology, I'll just say technology, take that anywhere, VR, however you want to do that. Um, what technology would you be bullish on as a vehicle to drive market growth in Southeast Asia for brands? Mobile games. Okay. Ser seriously, mobile games. I mean, yeah. that's where, all, that's where the, that's where the eyeballs are. That's where the thumbs are. That's where the, the engagement is, right? Okay. You know, a lot of talk again in this year um, as we've different markets coming out of COVID, there's been a lot of talk around the world about the, the attention economy. Something that, Todd, you probably remember us talking about the t attention economy 15, 20 years ago, right? But yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's sort of come back in a huge way in the last 12 months because of that realisation that, when we were all locked at home and sitting in our houses for two months or three months or five months or in China it's seemingly forever, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed like it was easy to get people's attention, right? Because they had nothing else to do. And now, well, now, now they're out. Well, the truth is, you know, that if you want to get people's attention, young, young people, particularly in Asia, um, the thing they're paying attention to is this, the screen on their mobile phone, and they're playing yeah. games on it. Right. So yeah. get in there and, and explore that. And, and I, I, you know, it's everything from we're starting to see again, the, the idea of placing products inside games is not you. You know, we, we've been doing that. And we've been buying the rights to do that for 20, 25 years. That's that's not a big deal. But the, the it's the it's the thing like the in-game chat boards. Right. Um, yeah. So for, for most people in young, young people in Asia, the number one social mediums are the in-game chat boards, right? That's that's where they do all their real conversations. That's where their yeah. friends are formed, right? Yeah. Um, and so whether you're doing market research in those boards or actually marketing in those boards, um, that's, that's a big growth area. What about fatigue? Because, I mean, I think one of the fascinating things about marketing is that we're always – um, chasing humans, um, yeah. and humans are always changing, which makes it a never ending, uh, game that everyone can always play despite, you know, for a thousand, 10,000 years, right. Essentially things haven't changed as you said, right off the top. Right. Um, but essentially we, we generally have fatigue, right. And so we, that's, you know, we, we constantly have to keep up with that. Um, is this something that, um, is very prevalent? in that area of the world? Like decision yes fatigue no. I mean, or yeah. product placement fatigue or... Right, right, right. You know, yes and no in terms of, I think there's, from the practitioner side of the business person, there's always this desire like, oh, and a misconception, oh, we've got to have the new, the new thing. We've got to have the new campaign. We've got to, have the, we've got to launch the next product. Exactly. Because yeah. people are bored with us, people are bored with us. But, but, you know, then when you look at the numbers and you find out in nearly every category, yes, it might be an advantage to have a repertoire, you know, five or six flavors. But the truth is 
two flavors will always sell you 80, 85, 90% of all your product, right? Yeah. And the other ones are just, it's sort of just gloss to gain a bit of interest, but people return back to the core, right? Yeah. Um, I think the, the problem with fatigue is quite often it's perceived as fatigue. But we, we perceive fatigue where it's not necessarily there. We look for fatigue. Um, and that's because when you're in business, you've got to be justifying doing something, right? And you've got to be doing something new. And so we have this constant sort of thing. Now, don't get me wrong, you know, uh, Asian com uh, uh, companies do this as much as anybody else. And you have Asian business cultures that define things as you've got to have, you've got to go out there and splash things out. I mean, for example, Japanese companies, the big FMCG companies, right, are famous for the fact that they throw out lots more new products than the typical American FMCG company, right? But then the spirit they do it is differently. When, when a big American company decides to put out um, a new flavor of potato chips um, or a new toothbrush that's got a thinner head on it or something like that, right? The, inside the company, that's got to be seen, that's got to be a profit center. Okay, every, every new launch has got to be a profit center. Whereas the Japanese mindset is, we don't care if nine out of 10 fail. Well, that's, that's not the thing. We're just doing it to throw, throw them out there to see what sticks, right? Uh, and so there's a very different attitude sometimes with some of that stuff, right? Yeah. But to go back to your question about fatigue, I think one of the things is, and we, again, you know, the crucible of the last couple, two or three years has really forced some of these issues about the fact that we're finding out that people um, seem to be fatigued because they're bored, right? Um, mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that they are really fed up with something or they don't, they, they want something else. It's just, hey, you know, I, I, I'm bored. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so whether it's the new product or a new way of describing the product or just generating some new interest in, in the product, that continually becomes important because we're swamped with stuff, right? And, and you know, there's this big thing in uh, academia uh, about um, uh, mental availability. That's the big language now for marketing over the last five years has been the, the growth of this concept of mental availability, right? And, and mental availability is just making sure that your, your product, your, your message, whatever, is just constantly in people's faces, right? Uh, it's, it, you don't okay. know when to... I don't know when Todd is going to feel like a beer. I don't know, right? So, so I can't... So what I have to do is to make sure that, you know, he's sort of mentally aware of Labatt's the whole time, right? Oh, good uh, call. Mentally aware of Labatt's the whole time. And, and if he's mentally aware of Labatt's, there's a good chance the next day when he goes to the bar, he'll say, yeah, give me a blue. You know, so... <laughs> Oh man, it's uh, you. You went you went deep into the Canadian subculture on that one, and I appreciate yeah, yeah, that well, very yeah. much. Um, yeah, I used to really really enjoy my Labats. Um, <laughs> of course, as a as a fully uh, fledged member, card carrying member of the drinking age of Canada, for sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, talking about. Um, you know, eyeballs and the attention economy and, and stuff. Do, is, is there anything unique that you could talk to those brand owners that are listening, thinking about moving to, to Asia, um, that they need to be cognizant of where attention is great, attention attached to wallet better and yeah. how we get that into the wallet. Is there unique things that we need to be considering in that area of the world? Yeah, I, you know, it's very easy to be part of a fad or to get some people talking, right? Yeah. Uh, but, but as you say, the, the, as a business, I don't care if people talk about me. What I care about is they talk about me and desire me and then do something about it, right? Um, yeah. And so one of the things is uh, being careful about messaging or product delivery etc that is oh it's cute it's fun it's it's that's a really interesting thing in itself just the message um and not putting it really in the context of usage um 
So I, I don't mean that in terms of, you know, making a, making a TV commercial or making a film showing people using it. I mean, what are you doing in actually to get across to people to, in the right places um, so that the word gets out there? You know, um, you know, we sometimes belittle in modern worlds, but sampling, for example, is really important, right? Sampling in the right place, in the right circumstance, and it doesn't matter what it is, right? It, you, you could be talking about toothbrushes and you can be talking about, uh, you know, electronic cars, right, electric cars. You know, um, I was last night having a drink with a couple of friends of mine. Uh, one of them has just come back uh, from a bit of a road trip. Uh, somebody had got him to use an electric car for the first time. Uh, and so an electric car company basically said, da 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 we'll, we'll lend you one for five days for your road trip, right? Mm. Now, he was blown away. So he sat in this bar last night with three or four other guys and gave a 20-minute sales pitch for electric cars. <laughs> right? For another company, yeah. For, you know, right? And it's because, Completely unaffiliated, yeah. Yeah, completely unaffiliated, right? It's, and it's a bit of a story how come he got offered this thing. It doesn't matter, right? It's just that yeah. thing that... And we all know the, the single most powerful medium in the world to get your brand success is word of mouth, right? Is people who like your product or your service talking to other people about why they like it and getting them to try it, right? Like there's nothing better than... Hey, you know, this chocolate bar is great. Ta here, take a piece, you know, try that. It's fantastic, right? So that's a, that's a truism. It's age old, but it's truly effective today. And one of the things, of course, that we did see in, you know, interesting, if you think about the, food, the general food and beverage marketplace, you know, across the world, but especially here in Asia, we saw um, the different home delivery food services like Grab, Food Panda, et cetera, were very, very good at then offering experiential things for other products, right? So, you know, sampling situation. So you go on audio, your meal off Food Panda, but there's a, there's a toothbrush or a, or a sample of a new toothpaste in it, right? So eat the food and then brush your teeth with this. Well, those are great ways for getting people to actually think about like converting it, right? I, yeah, I'm going to do something about that. Yeah. And it's the, yeah. then the other thing, too, is, is just making it easier. You know, again, Southeast Asia, the companies like Amazon, of course, in some markets, Lazada, which is the big uh, online uh, retail site in, in Southeast Asia, um, you know, they've gone through a lot of learning about making sure that w how easy is it to purchase, how easy is it to ask questions about it, how easy it is it to get a refund if it goes wrong, for example? How easy it is it to get endorsements, et cetera, et cetera, to get people talking about it? Um, these are things that, you know, have changed the dynamic of stuff. And it's meant that traditional retailers have had to then rethink a lot of the, the services they're doing, you know, and, and how do they compete with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got you for a maximum of about nine minutes left here. So I want to, uh, and I'm getting through about 20% of my talking points per high level topic here. Thanks very much. Um, you're going to have to come back. We have to revisit all these high topics and uh, high level topics and get back into the Anytime. regulars. But for now, and um, I, I, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, and now that you and I are seeing each other face to face, you know, for, for the first time, um, this is going to be an interesting way that I put this, but I want to talk about, um, talking about the uh, silver uh, population uh, <laughs> talking about because you 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 actually put a ton of importance yes and, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the silver haired um, uh, yes. that you are um, you put a ton of importance on that on that cohort on that group of of consumer and I just want you to tell us at first why do you put a lot of focus on older consumers and 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 what and why and how brands need to to be sure. really paying attention and resonating with those that consumer class? Sure. Well, you know, I've been interested in the aging population issue since 1988. And there's a long story yeah. why, why that happened. But as I moved to Asia and became more involved in marketing in Asia and looking at the Asian context of things, as I said, Japan, oldest country in the world, uh, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan, have all been in that sort of top 10 countries for not only longevity, but also the proportion of the population that's old, right? Or yeah. older, right? Yeah. We're now in a world where 
very soon we're going to get to the point where 25% of the pop world's population is over 60. Yeah. Um, we're in a situation where you have big markets like Japan where that's, that happened years ago, right? Um, China's very close to that. But the other thing I always like to point out is when we think of Asia, sometimes, you know, particularly in the West, we think of, oh, it's young populations. And we think of that because of places like Vietnam, Indonesia, India, you know, and, and you'll always hear this thing. And it's true, you know, like, well, 70 percent of the population's under 35 or whatever. right? It, OK. Those three countries, for example, Indonesia, Vietnam and, and India, 10 percent of the population is over 60 and it's the fastest growing segment of the population. In nearly every country across Asia, the fastest growing segment of the population are people over 60. People are having fewer kids, and at the same time, more people are living longer. Yeah. So what happens then, right? We live in a world driven by 1950s, mostly American marketing rules, which says, go for the teenager, get them while they're young. You know, yeah. now, when you actually look at it, we now find out, well, there's almost no evidence that if you get them when they're young, that they actually stick. It, 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 people don't stay with the same brands for, well, for 30, think, 40 years. They go back to that, that, that mathematical equation of cost of customer acquisition versus lifetime value. And that lifetime value is made up of length of time. So yeah. naturally, you think they're going to default to young uh, very you know, simply uh, until... They talk to you but, and get the but, nuances of it. But, the, you know, one of the problems with that model is, is in simple terms, young people don't have money, right? <laughs> young people buy cheap stuff. And I'll tell you the thing that really turned me on to this. Uh, end of the 90s, I was living here in Thailand and I was working for uh, one of my clients was one of America's biggest autom automobile companies. And they were, they were literally building a factory on the outskirts of Bangkok uh, they were going to get into the um, uh, the market in a heavy way in Southeast Asia with particular models of cars. And so one of the things we did was we, we went around and I had a couple of people who worked for me and they took me around to dealerships just to talk to dealers, right? And one Thai dealer said to me, we were talking about different cars and different people coming in and stuff, and he goes, oh, well, the truth is, you know, Unless you're over over 50, I don't really care. And of course, I, well, what do you mean, right? Well, of course, we sell lots of cars to people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Of course we do. But it's the guy over 50 that we really, we really worry about. Why? Because the guy over 50 buys the more expensive cars. The guy over 50 at, or 55 or 60, depending on the country, is at that age where the kids have grown up and maybe for the first time in their adult life, they can actually buy the car they want, not the car that they needed for the family thing. They're not mm -hmm. looking at the family drive, right? They're looking right. at, it's, they're looking at the pickup truck with the, with the guts or they're looking for a more sporty looking car, etc. And that's where the margins are. And so we, I took that on board and then started looking at a lot of other categories and discovered, wait a minute, in the travel industry, guess what? I worked, as you said, Cafe Pacific, American Airlines. I worked for a lot of airlines doing their advertising, right? And, of course, it's a truism in advertising that really they don't care about anybody in the back of the plane because they don't make any money from the people on the back of the plane. They make the money from the, the people paying full fares. Now, who pays full fares? People over 50, over 60, right? Mm -hmm. Young people don't. So the margins on targeting people over 60 is much higher in category after category. The other thing is there's a giant misconception about marketers that says, ah, yeah, but people over 60 never buys new stuff. That might have been true 50 years ago when even in America, for example, people died by the time they were 72, 73. If you're a Japanese woman who's, who's turned 60 today, on average, you will live to be 97, right? There's more and more awareness across Asia that, hey, you know what? We're going to live to be in our 90s. So at 60, what am I going to do with the next 30, 40 years? And we're not going to just do the same stuff and we're not going to use, we're not going to use the same pair of shoes for the next 40 years, right? We're not going to use the same toothbrush. We're going to keep on buying stuff. But the other thing, of course, is, and maybe a little bit more in Asia than it is in the West, we sometimes forget that people in Asia 
that are, say, in their early 60s have lived a lifetime of constant change, of constant exposure to new stuff, of adapting to new things. Yeah. Now, we sometimes have this stereotype that everybody who's over 60 can't adapt to stuff. No, 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 it's quite the opposite. In fact, uh, MIT and other institutions have sort of shown that people in their 60s are as adaptable and probably have adapted to more new technologies than people under 30, right? Because yeah. people under 30, there has been ma no major new new technology yeah. for 25 years. They've grown up years, with it. Yeah. Right? Well, th there has been nothing new to adapt to. They've grown up with the internet. They've grown yeah. up with mobile phones. Yeah. Their parents and their grandparents were the ones that had to adapt, right? And so if it's you take tootin'. that on board, yeah. And so when you take that on board, that's why the future is all about aging populations. The positive okay. future of kids. Okay, thank you. Um, I am going to come to you for a couple of recommendations. But before I do that, there's one topic. We've never talked about this on the show before. And I'm not sure if it has anything to do with, you know, the silver uh, market um, and where they spend some of, mo more of their time than young people. And it is not a commentary on where we think the state of the world is going in today's economy. But I want to talk about toilets. And I want to talk to you to talk to me about how you got involved with toilets and what are you up to in the toilet space right now? Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> toilets, I, I give a lot of talk at conferences uh, and stuff, right? And, and I have a, to a, a talk that's called My Mum's Throne Room, which was, uh -huh. uh, it, it's actually about, um, I use toilets as a symbol and I talk about toilets in society and the way in which people think about toilets and the importance of toilets. You may not know this, for example, that uh, if you live in a house, in a home in most parts of Asia that has, does not have an indoor toilet and then you put an indoor toilet into that home, uh, the chances of the women in your home being raped in their lives is reduced by 90%. Um, the number one condition for getting raped in Asia is having to use outdoor toilets, huh? right? Yeah, think about it, right? Okay. Having to walk, okay. having to walk the foot, the 20, 30, 40, 50 feet to the toilet or the pit down in the sure. field is a danger yeah. zone, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah It also yeah. drastically reduces the chance of infant mortality. Uh, it reduces lifespan, it increases lifespan. So there's a whole bunch of statistics around that. But actually, it came about because. I was doing some research at, at first here in Thailand, but then in other major cities where we're looking at pe families that have moved from the rural areas to the big city in the last few years and what they really thought was important. And what, when we did an experiment where we said, take photos of the stuff that you would miss the most, if everything around your apartment or your little house disappeared, I was blown away because everybody took photos of their toilets, right? <laughs> And the reason they said that was, and remember, these are people that have lived in villages, mm -hmm. right? And they've moved to the city and they said, look, back in the village, all my cousins have a TV set. Some have refrigerators. If you can steal electricity, you can have those things, right? But none of them have a flushing toilet. And actually, we then did some work and explored the idea that the defining technology of being, being middle class for 200 years now has been an indoor flushing toilet. It's the single yeah. technology that changes lives the most. And it's also the symbol of a changed life more than any other. Um, okay. So that's yeah, why I talk I, about toilets. I, I love it. Um, and and I'm sure water treatment probably followed quickly after that. Yes. I know that was you yeah, know, yeah. Bill, Bill Gates and you know everything got into that. Okay. Uh, Dave, really appreciate that. Can you Would you mind throwing a couple of your friends under the bus and dropping just a couple of names of some guests that we can uh, go after and say, hey, Dave recommended you for the show and he actually did it on air? Uh, okay. Uh, under the bus um, in Japan. <laughs> in Japan, uh, okay, there's a, a guy named Jesper Cole. He's German originally. He's lived in Japan for 30-plus years. He's okay. one of the leading economists in the country. Uh, he's been advisor to prime ministers and all sorts of people up there. And he's probably the number one guy that can explain the positive side of, of the Japanese economy and how the Japanese economy and its effect on people and marketing really works. Um, okay. So great guy to have a talk to him. Brilliant. Um, who else? Uh, probably if you think about um, – 
there's a really interesting guy in India, and I know you, you know, you, you're more sort of East Asia focused. There's a friend of mine in India, a guy named Previn Shikhar. Now, Previn actually, his history was he set up and, and runs and owns a couple of market research agencies that specialize in the healthcare. But actually, what he's done in the last few years is he um, acts as a consultant on um, what he would call guerrilla marketing, right? And he, he travels around working with smaller companies around Asia, helping them understand how to think differently about marketing. Uh, not in the big scale, not not in the big, you know, let's let's put a $5 million ad campaign together. Let's have to do things small in different ways. He's a really clever guy, um, really brings some real insight into day-to-day -day small businesses, right, and how small businesses can shift things and then how other bigger businesses can take advantage of those shifts. Okay, awesome. Dave, thanks very much. Um, to everybody who is watching the video, please um, keep in mind that we have the audio version as a podcast over on like Stitcher and Spotify and Apple Podcasts and everywhere that you get your podcasts. And for those listening on audio, we also have this on video. Please uh, like and subscribe and share and tell us what you think and obviously get in touch if you ever want to have any influence and commentary on what we do here at The Negotiation. Uh, but uh, for now, that's going to bring us to the end. Dave McCoggan, thank you very much uh, founder and storyteller at bibliosexual dave thanks for coming on the show thanks very much for having me